。日本前首相安倍晋三离世消息震惊各界，许多国外网友都纷纷在推特抛出他在二零一六年里约奥运闭幕式上扮演安倍马里奥接棒东京奥运的画面，其中一段影片累积近八十五万观看次数。外媒报道提及，安倍当时致力于说服国际奥会委员，日本有能力主办奥运。也因此成为二零二零东京奥运的头号推动者。拜登再签四亿美元援乌助乌克兰。美国宣布将增加更多高机动性多管火箭系统和新型精准火炮弹药给乌克兰。随着乌克兰军方致力阻止俄罗斯部队与东部顿巴斯地区推进，乌克兰首席谈判代表八日也说，这场冲突已出现转折点。原日本公安调查厅的调查分析官藤谷昌敏在电视访谈中表示。估计中共目前已经向日本派遣了两万至二点五万名左右的间谍或特工，但日本公安调查厅的职员只有一千七百人，双方人数完全不成比例。俄乌战事引发台海安全联想，去年五月接任太平洋舰队司令的帕帕罗上将发据对媒体表示，正在举行的环太平洋军事演习，针对某些破坏国际秩序的行为，美军会为台海冲突做好准备。新航亚太电视整理报道。Dangerous situation: Air China plane loses screws during landing. After the China Eastern Airlines Boeing 737 crashed in March, killing 132 people, aviation safety issues in China made people more and more concerned. Recently, a situation happened that left everyone who saw it in fear. On July 7th, Chinese residents filmed and shared on social media that during Air China Flight CA1921, the screws on one side of the wing were loose and kept shaking from the impact of airflow. It seems the screws almost fell out, making everyone worried about it. On the same evening, Air China responded to the matter. They said that it immediately inspected the relevant parts of the aircraft, repaired the loose screws, and checked on the fleet at the same time. Many netizens also left their comment on the situation. A Weibo user said, "There are five screws in the upper part through the visual inspection part. One fell off, and three were moving. Conclusion: a bit scary." Another asked, "How did this plane get past ground inspection and take off?" Chinese society is becoming more and more emotionless. In October 2017, China's Good Samaritan law was passed to protect people ready to help others. Under the legislation, people who voluntarily offer emergency assistance to those believed to be injured, ill, endangered, or otherwise incapacitated will not have civil liability in the case of damage to the victims. However, social media has continuously reported news reflecting the scary indifference of Chinese society in daily life. On July 7th, a video showed an accident on the streets of Beijing. The scene shows a woman under a tricycle. While she is lying motionless, passersby only cross and have an indifferent look. Some people watched in disgust with each other. There weren't any to help or take her to the emergency. Mr. Fernando Mata Licon published an article on Medium.com titled "Why People Won't Normally Help You in an Accident in China." Chinese people are kind-hearted and caring, but for many years, authorities and media promoted fear and indifference and pushed people towards being greedy and selfish. Just to mention an example, in 2006, in Nanjing City, an older woman named Xu Shoulan was trying to get off a bus. She fell off and broke her femur. Peng Yu passed by, helped take her to the hospital, and gave her 200 yen to pay for her treatment. Xu wanted Peng to pay for all the expenses of her treatment. She sued him, and she won after six months. So Peng had to cover all the medical expenses for her. The court made an odd statement: no one would, in good conscience, help someone unless they felt guilty. Zhejiang factory fire breaks out for unknown reasons. Recently, many factories in China have suffered dangerous fires. On July 7th, a fire broke out at the Mugao Industrial Zone factory in Ningbo, Zhejiang. The video shows the fire is out of control and black smoke rises and covers the sky. The cameraman said that there was a huge explosion. So far, there seems to be no casualties. The cause of the fire is unknown at the moment and is still being investigated. Two men. Rumor of COVID prevention trial leaked. People rush to buy food. The Chinese government has implemented zero COVID policy to fight outbreaks, although it has impacted heavily on people's life and the economy. In Tumen City, Yanbian Autonomous Prefecture, Jilin, at midnight on July 6th, people started spreading the news about a disease prevention rehearsal. This alleged leaked information caused people to panic and rush to buy food. The video shows people competing to do the shopping in the early morning, and the streets become crowded. They seem to be scared of what people went through in Shanghai.
国际社会哀悼安倍辞世。美国总统拜登前往日本驻美使馆吊唁，赞扬安倍是美国忠实朋友，深化两国联盟，推动印太区域愿景。拜登也致电日本首相岸田文雄，表达哀悼。And he、uh, he was deeply committed to strengthening the alliance and friendship between the United States and Japan, and pursuing an open and free Indo-Pacific region. 美国印度宣布降半旗哀悼，巴西总统发布三天哀悼令，联合国安理会会前全体默哀，对安倍表达最深敬意。外媒评价安倍外交成就，包括推动自由开放印太地区，开启美日印澳四方安全对话，对抗中共野心扩张。उनके कार्यकाल में भारत जापान में उनके जो राजनीतिक संबंध थे हमारे वो को नई ऊंचाई तो मिली ही हमने दोनों देशों की सांझी विरासत से जुड़े रिश्तों को भी खूब आगे बढ़ाया 美国《时代》杂志预告，下期杂志将以安倍黑白照为封面，并在官方推文写道：“安倍改变日本在世界的地位，现任首相后仍有巨大影响力。” Prime Minister Abe was a friend of mine, an ally, and an incredible patriot. He was a tireless champion for peace and for freedom, and for the priceless bond between the United States and Japan. And 美国前总统川普哀悼安倍离世，赞扬安倍是了不起的领导人，也是一位强硬的谈判者，同时具有巨大的道德勇气。安倍骤然辞世，各国领袖痛失挚友，区域局势发展也增添未知数。现场电视台北综合报道。Chinese media outlet Dajie Yuan reported on July 7th that China's textile and garment industry is suffering from a large number of orders moving out of the country like never before. According to the report, China is the world's largest manufacturer and supplier of textiles and garments. The regime relies heavily on exports of textiles and garments to secure foreign exchange reserves and stable employment. In the first half of 2022, data from the China Chamber of Commerce for Import and Export of Textiles (CCCT) estimated that the scale of China's textile and garment orders transferred overseas was about six billion dollars. Among these, one billion came from textiles and five billion from garments. More specifically, India was the main place for textile orders, while Bangladesh, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Indonesia took apparel orders. An official at CCCT said that the transfer scale would increase to about $10 billion in the second half of this year, $8 billion of which would relate to garment orders and the rest to textiles. Yue Jin, pseudonym, head of a small textile firm in Wujiang of Jiangsu Province, said, "This year's performance is very weak, even more challenging than 2020, and all orders have dropped by at least 40% compared with last year." He added that other local small and medium enterprises are also in the same situation. Raw material prices have risen since the beginning of this year, but companies have had to keep the same prices for their products to be competitive. Meng Zhuo, manager of Anhui Garment Import and Export Co Limited, said that most factories have no customers' orders by September this year. At the same time last year, the orders lasted until at least November, and the production of garment factories was too tight to complete all orders then. But this year, factories will have no orders two or three months earlier than expected. The China Chamber of Commerce for Import and Export of Textiles has recently conducted a survey where 30% of the surveyees were small and medium enterprises. The result shows that 85% of the companies think that the customers' orders within the industry will be transferred overseas, according to China Finance. Hu Kehua, deputy director of Office for Social Responsibility at China Textile and Apparel Industry Council, said that the main reason for the poor market is due to epidemic prevention and control. According to the latest banker survey, only 33.1% of bankers in China believe that the country's current macroeconomic situation is normal in the second quarter, a decrease of 29% from the first quarter. At the same time, those bankers who believe that China's current monetary policy is moderate also decreased 12.6% from the first quarter. The results were revealed on June 29th, when China's central bank released the survey of bankers for the second quarter of 2022. The survey shows that in the banking climate index, only the sub-index of monetary policy sentiment increased in the quarter. The other sub-indexes all declined, such as the loan demand, bankers' confidence, profitability of China's banking industry, and the macroeconomic heat sub-index. The respondents of the questionnaire are heads of various banking institutions in China, as well as presidents of the first and second-tier branches of these banks, or vice presidents in charge of credit. Song Weijun is a political and economic researcher with 27 years of experience in China's financial industry. 
He said that fewer bankers think the macroeconomic condition is normal, mainly because China's COVID epidemic prevention policy has worried the banking sector and businesses. Song explained that the pandemic has blocked administrative areas, leading to disruption of economic operations, stagnation of supply, and industrial chains, difficulty in maintaining business operations, and unrecoverable bank loans. And although Chinese banks are eager to increase the scale of loans, businesses are afraid or unwilling to borrow to expand operations. As a result, the economy faces the triple pressure of shrinking demand, supply shock, and weakening expectations. It is also worth noting that China's financial condition is at higher risk following the thunderstorm incident of Henan Rural Banks that occurred in April. The depositors could not withdraw money from their accounts and have been trying to retrieve their savings, but the problems have not been resolved. The risks in the banking sector have become the focus of depositors and investors. Beijing's comprehensive crackdown on the leverage of real estate has caused a large number of defaults among property developers. Some analysts warn that China's real estate debt crisis has just begun. As reported by Bloomberg on July 7th, Charlene Chu, a senior analyst at Autonomous Research, a division of Sanford C. Bernstein and Co., estimated that there would be 30 companies defaulting with total liabilities of around $1 trillion. In a June 15th interview on the One Decision podcast, Chu said that, while collaterals secured bank loans to developers, the situation could worsen if lenders started revaluing collaterals at lower prices. Chu explained, We've got a property sector that is almost dead and barely growing and used to employ huge numbers of people and a lot of downstream industries for furniture, and home goods and electronics and appliances. She added, all of that is getting impacted by this property slowdown, and that's why I think we're still early in the game here. She also mentioned that China's working age population, a real estate consumer group, peaked at 801 million in 2015, but has declined by 20 million since then. As debt expands throughout the economy, she believes this will be one of the structural issues affecting China's economic growth. Chen Laum, an economist at Beijing-based consulting firm Plenum, echoes that China has to make sure defaults in the real estate industry don't lead to a broader financial crisis. Besides, the mortgage rates must be set to stay well above the 2014 slump. He adds that China's central government officials don't want to take the blame if things get out of control again. The home prices of the world's second-largest economy dropped for the ninth month in May signaling demand stays weak despite the government's increased support for the slumping property market. Sales in major cities fell over 40% from May, as lockdowns suspended businesses and unemployment surged. Lu Ting, the chief China economist at Nomura Holdings, Inc., comments that this is the worst property downturn on record. Iris Pong, the China economist at ING Group NV, states that employment has to recover to increase demand for housing. This depends heavily on the chance of lockdowns in the future, and she doesn't expect a rebound in sales until 2023.